Amen. What a wonderful and beautiful way to enter into worship this morning, Amen. to gather together. My name is Reverend Jennifer Finley, our Momentum and Discipleship Pastor here at First UMC in Kirksville. And wherever you are this morning, wherever this morning finds you, we are so glad to be joining in worship together. Good morning, church. My name is Scott Beard. I'm a lead pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Kirksville. I welcome you to worship. I pray that you sense a movement of the Holy Spirit as this time together that we celebrate uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Couple of reminders. We are heading towards Super Bowl Sunday next week, and I know that's important for football for some folks, but here we are also thinking about soup as in bringing soup for our local food pantry, the pantry for Adair County. We're well on our way, uh, but we are competing with our other local churches, and uh, I know there's some of us who might want that trophy to stay with us here at First UMC. So we are still collecting soup this week. You're welcome to drop that by in the morning. Um, if you're not quite at the point of entering buildings yet, we can come to your car and pick that up for you. Um, if you'd like to come in the building, though, we'd love to see your faces. This has been a good opportunity for us to mm -hmm. get to have some conversations with those of you who are out and about a little bit. So if you still have soup, bring that on by this week as well. As a reminder, we also have an online bulletin and an online connection card. And that connection card is the way that you can let us know how we can be in prayer for you and your family. There's ways to mark that as pastors and clergy eyes only or to include on the prayer list. And as we do each week, we invite all of us to prepare our worship spaces wherever we are this morning to find a source of light. It might be a candle. It might be a flashlight. It might even be the light of a cell phone or a computer. Whatever it is for you this morning, wherever you are. Take that source of light as we light these candles together. Acknowledging the power of the Holy Spirit that is already present. Bringing us together in these moments of worship. And as we do that, we also invite you to have bread and juice, cracker or grapes or whatever else you might have with you as elements for Holy Communion later in the worship service. And now, as our worship spaces are prepared, we join our voices together in this call and response call to worship. Beloved, do you love the God who hovered over the face of the deep? and called the worlds into being. Yes, yes we, we know, know that, that we, we do. do. Hear the call to feed God's children. Beloved, do you love the God who came to us in Jesus Christ? Yes, yes we, we know, know that, that we, we do. do. Hear the call to love God's children. Beloved, do you love the God who breathes new life into us, even as we gather this day? Yes, yes, we, we know, know that, that we, we do. do. Hear the call to feed, to love, to serve. Come, let us listen for the Spirit. Come, Come let, let us, us worship. worship. Let us continue in worship singing the hymn, Jesus Calls Us, it's number 398. It's also in your online bulletin. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our lives while restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. As of all the apostles heard it by the Galilean lake, turn from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for Jesus' sake, Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden store, from each idol that would keep us, saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of case, Still we calls in cares and pleasure, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus. 
Jesus, calls us by thy mercies. Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience. Serve and love thee best of all. Amen. And now we join our voices together in this affirmation of faith. We believe, believe that, that there, there is, is one body of Christ working in the world, one Holy Spirit who sustains and comforts, one hope that stirs our hearts when we hear your call, one voice who calls each of us to follow, one faith that we strive to live up to daily, one God and creator of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Amen. Well, as we come to this time of prayer, I encourage you, if you've not done so already, to maybe light that candle that you have in your worship space. And if not, to think about the light of the world that came through Jesus Christ. For we light candles as a reminder that God's Holy Spirit is with us and with each and every situation in our lives. That so many times... The world seems very dark, especially in this time of year and during the current situation of the pandemic. It's easy to focus on the darkness and yet God calls us to look to the light, the light of his son Jesus Christ, the light of the world that shines in the darkest corners, that helps us to see that God is always present with us. That the light of God is there to guide our path. And to help us see a new and better way. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we gather to worship you today. We gather to lift up your name, to celebrate all that you've done for us throughout our entire lives. We gather to thank you for the many gifts of our home and family and community and loved ones and our very life itself. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world, that we might see more clearly the pathway to you. Lord, as we gather today, we also want to lift up those who have been struggling with the pandemic, those who have been suffering from the illness, those who are struggling with isolation, those who are the health care workers, those who are the frontline workers in our society, the teachers and the doctors and the lawyers and those who are working with people face to face. Lord, help us to truly know that you're with each and every one of us and give us support and comfort in these challenging times. And Lord, we pray that you continue to guide us as we go on this journey together, that you help us to reach out to others that they too may know your love and your grace, that we can truly be instruments of your peace and justice, that others will know of, of a fair and equitable society, that we can be with the people who are the peacemakers, who we know you call as blessed. And Lord, we lift up our own lives to you because Lord, sometimes we get blinded by the things right in front of us and have a hard time seeing your face through the clouds and the gloom. And Lord, we know that you are there. We know that your face shines through, through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, let us truly accept the nudgings of the Holy Spirit to step up when we're called to step up and to step aside when we're called to step aside. Lord, we continue to desire to be the best disciples of you through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can possibly be. We thank you for the gift of Jesus who came into the world that we might see a more clear path to you, that we might understand that our sin are forgiven and that we may someday be able to be face to face with you. 
that we may be able to spend eternity with you and your love, continually surrounded by your grace. Lord, we lift these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let us continue in worship with singing. We're going to sing the song, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. other oceans ever longed for my souls who are waiting my loving friend has thus you call me O Lord with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling has spoken my name shoreline behind me by your side I will seek other seas the scripture that we were selected today to help illustrate the point of the sermon is one that comes from the gospel of John chapter 21 and you may recall this story. It actually occurs after Jesus' resurrection. Probably about two weeks after that. We don't know the exact time frame. But Jesus has risen from the dead and he's appeared twice to the disciples behind the locked doors. You remember the story of Thomas and the others greeting Jesus with joy. And yet, it isn't very long before they're back to what they did before. They're back to fishing. And Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel and James and John and two other unnamed disciples have decided to go out on the Sea of Galilee and to fish. And they've been there all night long and haven't caught a single fish. 
This reminds me of their call story, doesn't it? It reminds us of the story when Jesus first called them. Because they look up and there's a figure on the shore saying, how's the fishing going, guys? And they say, well, we haven't caught anything all night. Well, he says, throw the net on the other side of the boat. And when they do, they bring in a load of fish larger than any they'd ever pulled in before. Well, Peter knew immediately that this figure was not a stranger, but their Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter jumps in the water and he, and he swims to the shore because he's not even patient enough to wait to, to, to row the ship in or the boat. And he, he decides he's just going to swim to the shore to be with Jesus. And the other disciples follow. And when they get to the shore, Jesus is there with a charcoal fire. And he's grilling up some fish and some bread in order to feed his disciples breakfast. Breakfast on the lake shore. Sounds pretty idyllic. Well, the scripture starts with John 21, starting with verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Meaning his buddies. Well, he said to him, well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Well, a second time he says to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. So then Jesus says to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me? Well, Peter was feeling hurt because he, he had said to him the third time, Do you know, do you love me? And, and he said to them, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Well, Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. I've always loved this scripture passage. And I think it's in part because there's comfort in it, but there's also challenge. I think I'm drawn to it in part because of its intimacy. There's this intimate moment as Jesus and his disciples share that one final meal together before Jesus steps aside and the disciples step up into their roles of sharing Jesus' message on their own as they step into an unknown and chaotic future there's a palpable, almost tangible sense about the story as we hear it. We almost feel the conflicting emotions, the love in these moments, but also the hesitancy. The disciples wondering perhaps if they're ready for life without Jesus' physical presence with them. And I wonder if Jesus, even as the risen Christ, had that one final moment of decision to step aside and return to his father and let the disciples carry on. I wonder what that moment was like for Jesus as he trusted that all he had taught and modeled in his life and his death and his resurrection would be enough to carry them through. And then comes even this more intimate moment with Jesus and Simon Peter. Jesus calling Peter by name. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I do. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. It's simple and profound. All Peter has to do, all we have to do, is tend to the sheep. But I wonder if Peter still had questions of how. What will it look like, Jesus, feeding the sheep, tending the flock, sharing your love? What will it look like tomorrow? And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And of course, those are our same questions as well. 
And they're questions that we have been asking together as part of this short worship series as we are in between the end of the Christmas season and the beginning of Lent in a few weeks. We're asking these questions together. What are we to do? How are we to love well? And we've been putting those questions in conversation with scripture and with a prayer from our Methodist heritage, the covenant prayer and the Wesleyan tradition. The first week, a couple of weeks ago, we used that prayer and we affirmed that we are God's children formed by God's steadfast love. And last week, we affirmed that we are neighbors and that God is with us on the easy paths and the hard paths of being neighbors together. Today, this third week is a continued invitation to allow Jesus' words, those words of feed my sheep, and our questions to mingle in prayer together, to allow God to speak to our hearts and our minds and our souls in new ways. I've been thinking this week that this prayer, it's a dangerous prayer in some ways, for it puts ourselves in a relationship with tr of trust with God, simply through the act of praying. And so this morning, as Scott and I read these words together, we invite you, if you are ready, to pray them with us. If you're not, that's fine. Simply let these words be in conversation with our scripture. I am not, not my, my own, own self-made, self-reliant self human being. In truth, O oh God, I am yours. Make me into what you will. Make, Make me a neighbor, neighbor with, with those whom you will. will. Guide, Guide me on the easy path for you. Guide me on the rocky road for you. Whether I am to step up for you or step aside for you. Whether I am to be lifted high for you or brought low for you. Whether I become full or empty. With all things or with nothing. I give all that I have and all that I am for you. So be it. And may, and may I, I always, always remember, remember that, that you, O oh God, and, and I belong, belong to, to each other. other. Amen. Amen. Well, today being the third week of this series, we're going to focus on this third portion of the prayer that we just read together. Whether I am to step up for you or step aside for you, whether I am to be lifted high for you or brought low for you, these are really challenging words, as Reverend Jennifer said. This can be a dangerous prayer because you're submitting to what God would have you to do. You're asking God to guide you and you're committing yourselves to do what God is wanting. In the scripture we read this morning, uh, Peter is being called by God, Jesus Christ, through uh, God through Jesus Christ, to step up and to feed the sheep. He's being asked to do something Beyond simply saying, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But love needs to be in action. And Jesus is pointing that out to Peter. That it's great to say you love me, that's important. But because you love me, feed my sheep. Tend the lambs. That being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not a passive role. But it's an actively feeding the sheep in any way they need to be fed. And I know sometimes we'd rather just be consumers of God's love and not step out of our comfort zones. We'd rather the ones who receive all the time and are less uh, willing to step out and do the things that God is calling us to do. And other times God asks us to step aside, to get out of the limelight, to not be the central person, but, but to be in a servant role, which maybe doesn't have the glamour that you might expect that your life should include. But yet that's the role you're being called to, to step up or step aside. And you need to pray and meditate on the times you're not sure which one that is. Well, God asked me to step up not quite a year ago when my father-in-law, Dave McGoldrick, Ann's dad, passed away. And David asked me about two years before that 
if I would do his funeral service when he died. Which caught me by surprise because at the time he wasn't ill, there wasn't any reason to think he might die soon. And after gasping my breath for a moment, I said, of course, Dad, I'll do anything you want. See, Dad McGoldrick was Catholic, and I assumed he'd want a priest to do his sermon, or his funeral. And they did plan to have a mass for him later. But not quite a year ago, in mid-February, he came down with a terminal cancer lymphoma and died a short time later. And then it became obvious to me that I did need to step up to do what he'd called me to do through my father-in-law. And I understand that that was my responsibility as a son-in-law. I'd known Dad McGoldrick for since about 60 years <laughs> that we met each other in 1960 when I was just a child. And Ann and I had been together for almost 44 years. And he was a dad to me, like a second dad. But he was very organized, too. In the last week of his life, he called all of us to meet with him one at a time. And he told me about the service he wanted and everything he wanted as a part of it. And he gave me a whole list of songs he wanted me to sing. He was very much prepared to go to the Lord. And I might not have preferred to do this. It wouldn't have been my choice. It would have been easier to sit in a pew and let someone else talk about my father-in-law. And yet, as hard as it was, it was the right thing for me to do, to step up and to be there for the family and to help them to celebrate his life and to remember how beautiful a person he was and how honest and forthright. God asked me to step up, and I did. Whether I am to step up for you, O oh Lord, or step aside for you. That phrase, that second part, stepping aside, caught me this week. Every time as I thought about how we were going to talk this morning together, I'm used to hearing that phrase as an acknowledgement that there are times when we, like Jesus, are called to step aside and lift up the voices of other people, a conscious choice to do that. But as I meditated on this this week and let it roll around in my heart and my mind and my soul, I heard something different. But I heard for myself was a reminder about a time about three months ago, um, late October. Most of you know that I had a mild case of COVID. Uh, end of October, early November. Um, many of you know that feeling. And as I prepared for those couple of weeks of being at home and having rhythms look very different, I received beautiful, amazing, lovely greetings from many of you, and I received a short email that had some greetings and well wishes, and then this simple line that was a reminder that said, being able to work from home doesn't mean you should if you aren't feeling up to it. Now that probably seems like common sense, but I'm not always known for my common sense when it comes to letting go of things that other people could do. And that was a reminder to me that I could step aside for a moment to put down some of the tasks that I could do and let others pick them up and let others care for me. Stepping aside so that God could care for me. I don't like to think about myself as the sheep in our scripture. I don't know that most of us do. But there's that moment of recognition that sometimes what we are called to do is step aside so that we can be loved, that we can be one of those sheep that are fed. And that is good, and that is holy, and that is always hard. You can ask Scott. I don't know that I did it gracefully. But it was a beautiful reminder in that time that God does call us sometimes to allow ourselves to be cared for.
few years ago, I was one of the pastors at Liberty and I Methodist Church in Liberty, Missouri, in the Kansas City area. And one of the ministries that the church had and had, had been doing for many, many years was once a month they would take a hot meal over to Kansas City, Kansas to a, a, a ministry called St. Mary's Kitchen. And there was a long history with St. Mary's Kitchen. It used to be in the basement of a Catholic church. And they would feed a hot meal seven days a week to whomever would show up. And many of these people were homeless or struggling with food insecurity. And the, the duty of making the meal each day of the seven days a week was usually a different church, sometimes different organizations, but oftentimes it was churches that did it. And, and Liberty and I Methodist had this particular Saturday of the month uh, for years. And so they asked me if I wanted to be a part of this crew to go over and feed those at uh, St. Mary's Kitchen in Kansas City, Kansas. And there was a lady within the church named Hazel Davidson. And Hazel was one of these type of a, of a kind of a youthful retiree person that could do most everything. And she did. And she was the, one of the best organizers. And when Hazel said, you need to do this, you didn't ask her why or when. You just did it. Hazel was that type of a leader. And still is. Well, each month we would prepare the meal, and the many of the the, uh, the people had made meatloaf. We often brought meatloaf, but there was other things that were brought. But they would prepare some of this food ahead of time, and then we'd go. We'd take the church bus over to Kansas City, Kansas, and we would prepare this meal. And you know, it might have been natural for me as one of the pastors of the church to be uh, like a leader within this crew that I would, you know, interface with the the manager of the ministry or I would be out front talking to the people who came through that were struggling with a variety of, of insecurities in their lives. Maybe it's financial or, or food or they have a lot of children and they couldn't feed them. And, and it would have been natural for me to greet them and to spend the time with them and to do those kinds of things up front in the spotlight, if you will. But Hazel asked me if I like to cook. And I said, well, yeah, I do like to cook. And she said, well, would you be willing to work on the hotline back on the stove, big commercial stove, gas stove, and make the soup? Well, my first time there, I didn't know what that was entailing. But Hazel gave me a pot each time of some sort of a stock, usually a beef stock or a chicken stock, that she had boiled down at home. And she hands me this pot, and she'd say, make soup with this and the leftovers in the refrigerators. You see, Hazel didn't like to see anything wasted. And we would go through the refrigerators there because there was a hot meal served every day. There was always a partial pan of corn or beans or mashed potatoes, any kind of vegetable, different types of meat. And it was my job to figure out a way to combine all these things together in a soup or a stew that would be tasty and nutritious and help people f to live out another day on the street. And so it was kind of a challenge. It was a challenge to figure out how to take these variety of different ingredients and I had no idea what I was going to have that day to work with and to create something that was tasty. So there would be a little bit of a corn and, you know, I never thought about putting mashed potatoes in soup until you try it and just make it so thick and wonderful. And so many different things combined together. It makes me think of our society as a combination of all these different things brought into one stew together. And that certainly was representative of the people that came through the lines, many of them children. They came through to get a hot meal. One of the things that the, the kitchen crew knew that I wouldn't do was I wouldn't put hot dogs in the soup. And they always would say, well, it's meat, right? I says, this is an important culinary expertise that requires to make this kind of soup. You don't put hot dogs in my soup. And so everything else went in. Everything else went in that was palatable, that would combine together. And you know, I really enjoyed that role because I was on the back line. Nobody there even knew that I was a pastor. Nobody knew I would came as a leader, part of the leadership from this church because Hazel was in charge and I was just there Feed the sheep. 
We hope that as we're sharing our stories, you're thinking about the ways in which you have been called to step up or step aside. Then we get to this phrase of the prayer, lifted high or brought low for you, O Lord. And I'll admit I've struggled with this language, both in John Wesley's original language and in the paraphrase that we are using. For I don't believe that God causes us to be brought low or high, in the sense that I don't believe our loving God causes us to suffer. Yet, as I've meditated with this prayer these past few weeks, I have also heard something new. Something about what we or others may consider high or low status and how God relates to that. Many of you know that I consider myself a small town girl at heart. I grew up in Jeff City. It's not a tiny town by any means, but it's certainly not a large place. And I found great joy in rooting and grounding in life here and in other small communities. But there was a time when I thought I wanted something different. At the time, I was living in a community much smaller than Kirksville and much more geographically isolated. And yes, for our college students, that is indeed possible, I promise. Uh, it was a beautiful area of the mountains in North Carolina, but it was isolated. And I had the opportunity to move to a much larger area and begin a job that had, in some people's eyes, and maybe in my own, higher status. And I made that move, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed living in the larger metro area of St. Louis. I enjoyed making friends in a new place. I enjoyed all of the things that are afforded in an area like that. But over the course of time, I found that what was considered high by some living in a large metro area wasn't what I loved. It wasn't what made my heart sing. I found that what might be considered high status by some isn't what brought out my best God-intended self. And I found that what some might consider lesser status is actually what allowed me to live into new parts of God's call to love myself and love others. Most of you know that I love Kirksville and I will shout that to the rooftops for anybody who will listen to me. And so as I was reflecting on that story, I was reminded that brought high or brought low isn't necessarily about what God thinks. But sometimes our human categories get in our way of truly hearing that call from God, that call to feed the sheep, to love the people, regardless of what that looks like. As we have prayed and as we have talked this morning, I hope that stories have come to your mind. As you have prayed these words, stories of stepping up and stepping aside, times when you were unsure of what was to come next in life, times where it felt like you were lifted high and times where it felt like you were in the valley. What are your stories? This week's prayer practice is an invitation to share them, to write them down, share them with God, but share them with others. Who might you be able to share your stories with this week? For as we come to this table of grace, as we bring all of our tables together, we also bring all of our stories together. And so we invite you, as you pray these, prayer, these words, this prayer this week, and as we move into the final week of this series next week, to allow yourself to be in community, to share those stories with each other. As we are called to feed the sheep, we are also called to be fed. And so we come to this table of God's grace. Each and every one of us are invited. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be United Methodist. Because Jesus died for all. And this table represents God's grace that comes to us through his son Jesus. All are welcome. And as we come, as we bring our tables together, we come to God, acknowledging once again that we need God's help. We need God's presence and God's love in our lives. 
And so we invite you to pray these words, this prayer of confession together. We confess, confess that we, we often, often fail, fail to love with all that we have and are, often because we do not fully know what loving means, often because we aren't sure where you are leading us. us. Forgive, Forgive us the times we withhold part of who we are from you, from, from ourselves and from those we are called to love. love. Friends, hear this good news. God came to us in Jesus Christ withholding nothing, that we might know love and forgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In, In the, the name, name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, you are, you are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. And now with joyful hearts, this beautiful moment of worship that I love each and every week, we share the peace of Christ with each other. The love and peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And we invite you, as we do each week, to put that in the comments, to say that out loud wherever you are, even if only your pets can hear you. The love and peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he met in the upper room with his disciples to share in the Passover meal. They were coming together to acknowledge that God's grace and protection and deliverance had been with the people of Israel for all time. That even when they turned away from God, God drew them back and welcomed them with his open arms. So we too are called to the table of God's grace. And we invite you to take whatever you have this morning, to lift it up. There were days that we took one loaf and we broke it, sharing together. In these days, we lift up our individual pieces, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us together as one. And in the past, we've gathered together with one cup and celebrated the, the grace that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ from a single cup. And yet now we bring all of our cups together from wherever you are and whatever time you see this, in order to remind us that Christ shed his blood so that we might be saved. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice or crackers or grapes or whatever is assembled here on this table, Lord, that represents the body and blood of our Savior Jesus. And what is ever assembled on whomever's table who is worshiping with us at this time in the future, Whoever opens their hearts to receive God's grace, we pray that your Holy Spirit is there, that as we bring these into our body, we sense the body and blood of Christ within us, that we can go forth from this place with the courage to feed the sheep and to tend the lambs and to do the things we're called to do, whether it's to step up or to step aside, to be the hands and feet of Christ to the world. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And just before we eat, I'm always ready to eat at this point in feast. Just before we feast, we pray together. We have this blessing before the meal. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be, thy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. And now, now we take and we eat and we feast Christ's body broken, that the many may become one. Amen. We take the cup that represents the love of God represented through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that all might be saved through him. Whatever has brought you into worship this morning. 
And whatever stories have come to mind, stories of pain and joy, challenge and comfort. I hope, we hope and pray that these moments of sacrament have brought a quenching to your thirsts, a sense of God's love for you and the world. And as God's grateful children, we pray this prayer together. Eternal, Eternal God, God, we give, we give you, you thanks, thanks for this, this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us, one body gathered in you. Grant that we may go into our days in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. And now we invite you to stand wherever you are. Again, whether you are with other people or only your pets can see you, stand and sing with joy together. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you rest the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss a leper clean and do such as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you in me? Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true in you, but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go, where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. We have heard our names called. We have heard the call to love and to feed. And now we disperse once again into whatever this week holds for us personally and each, each other and in our community. We disperse knowing that God is with us, that the Holy Spirit is propelling us. Go with the task and the commission to love God and love each other and feed God's sheep. Go in strength and peace. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. 